Now, why do I say that based on my lecture tonight? Well, because as a scientific style lecture, I'm assuming for the sake of simplicity that physical time is time and that it begins at the moment of the Big Bang. Time and space come into being. And so the creator of time and space would have to be beyond time and space. Uh, unless you're willing to open these sorts of metaphysical issues, which didn't seem to me to be appropriate to air in this sort of meeting, but which I discuss in my written work. And, and in that work, then, I bring metaphysical arguments. Metaphysical issues require metaphysical arguments. And that's not what I've been uh, addressing this evening. But if you're interested, take a look at the books, you know, or the website. Yes, George? Doesn't singularity assume simplicity also? This is a very interesting question. He asked, does singularity assume simplicity? I, I've been sort of arguing with my friend Quentin Smith about this, and he seems to think that a singularity would involve a great deal of simplicity as much as God is simple. I, I don't think that's true, although here I would like to defer to the physicist. I think singularities come in a variety of forms. They have a, quite a range of properties. They don't even, they're not composed of a single point necessarily. So I, I don't think that it's true that a singularity is absolutely simple in the sense in which classical theology has said God is simple. Uh, singularities have quite a, a diverse number of physical properties. Yes, a yes, follow up on this. That if we look at today's uh, creative acts by human beings, you see simultaneous parts being created and put together to make something. Yes. And in a complex universe, I would presume that the, uh, the power that created could have, in, a, in the same fashion, uh, simultaneously created a number of parts together uh -huh. that fit together into the universe, the complex universe that we exist in today. And I think that makes a lot more sense and it helps in the argument of, uh, of uh, expanding universe having had a beginning, but complex beginning at that. Yes. The issue that you're raising is the question of the fine tuning of the universe. And this has erupted in, on the contemporary scene in discussions between physicists and philosophers about the extraordinary fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the Big Bang for intelligent life. It appears that the Big Bang was fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a complexity and precision that just defies human comprehension. And in an effort to explain this or explain it away, depending on your viewpoint, many scientists have gone so far as to resort to metaphysical hypotheses about multiple universes and parallel worlds, unobservable uh, from this one, in order to provide the probabilistic resources for getting such a finely tuned universe. So th that complements what I've said this evening and is another whole debate that uh, you'll probably hear other Templeton lecturers talk about, is this uh, extraordinary fine tuning of the, the Big Bang for intelligent life. Also what? Balancing the universe because balancing. it is necessary to create different parts put together to balance the universe. Oh. Because there's lots of issues of time and space, beginning, what comes first, yeah. what comes next, and that's why a lot of people are... Yeah, that will be all based on these initial conditions and the speed of the expansion and the homogeneity of it and things of that sort. Yes, down here. Um, two questions. Uh, one of them, the first one is basically what you expect this argument accomplishes. <coughs> so it seems to me that a good number of these premises that you're, you're listing are, uh, they're plausible, but I'm not sure how strong they are. For instance, the universe began to exist. You know, no matter what level you're at, you know, as far as uh, with your knowledge of cosmology, there has to be some admission of ignorance. Sure. Uh, I mean, there's no reason to think that we can see the whole universe. There's no reason to think that we, like it's been said, that we have theories that even explain uh, what's going on in the first uh, you know, few moments. So uh, it seems like the pr appropriate way to look at that st statement, the universe began to exist, is something like, hmm, maybe. That's possible. 
uh, number one, uh, whatever exists has a reason for its existence, the principle of sufficient reason. Uh, it seems to me that that's a metaphysical claim, not really a hard scientific claim. Science may rely on it, but in the extremes that we're talking about, I'm not sure how convincing it is. So overall, isn't it more logical to look at an argument like this and say, well, you know, there might be a creator. That's one explanation, and that's kind of an interesting idea, but it not really motivate you in any other way. Well, I think that will be largely person dependent uh, as to what a person finds convincing. I find the argument very convincing myself. Uh, you could have said what you said about the fourth premise before I even gave the lecture tonight. That, yeah, there might be a creator. Yeah, the universe might begin to exist. But you see, for millennia, it has been claimed from ancient Greek materialism up through modern idealism that the universe is eternal and uncaused and, uh, and uh, necessary in its existence, in effect. And this evidence, I think, just stands that on its head. And I think that the argument makes the conclusion that there is a personal creator like this very probable, in my estimation. And if you ask me, well, what, what is the value of that? I think the value of it is this, that if there really is a being like this, or if, if this even makes it plausible that there's a being like this, then surely it's incumbent upon us as human beings trying to make sense out of life in the universe and asking about the meaning of our existence to ask whether or not this creator God has revealed himself in the world in some way that we can know him more fully or whether he's remained aloof and detached from the world that he's made. And that is, I think, a deeply spiritual question. So I think this could motivate a spiritual quest, too. I have two questions. Yes. Real quick. The second one has to do with falsifiability. You're, you're claiming that you've got a real scientific theory here. Uh, but well, no, 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 no I, don't, I didn't say that. Oh. Uh, let's, let's be careful, because this is not a God of the gaps argument to try to say science proves God. All I'm, I'm, this is an argument for which scientific evidence provides support for premise four. And premise four is something that you, is a religiously neutral statement. That's theologically neutral. You can find statements like that in any book on astrophysics or cosmology. So I'm simply saying that the scientific evidence supports a premise in an argument that has sig theological significance. Okay, but uh, the, the problem, I'm not sure how big of a problem it is, but I want to hear you comment right. on it, is uh, if a pure scientist is looking at this, yeah. it, it would seem to me that they would be worried that this personal creator that you've come up with is immune to any type of evidential falsification. I mean, how are we supposed to find a timeless, spaceless, yes. beingless, changeless, necessary, uncaused, enormously powerful being? I, mean, I, I think you're right. But I, I guess I would want to know what is the significance of that. I mean, the old falsification principle that a statement is meaningless unless it can be falsified has gone out the window with positivism. I don't think falsification is necessary for a theory to be scientific. What's interesting about premise four is I think premise four, though it's not falsifiable, I think it is verifiable. That's significant, I think. In other words, God could have created a steady state universe, right, that looked eternal even though it ex had a beginning. Uh, I mean, he could have created the universe five minutes ago with appearances of age. So, that doesn't strike me as all that significant, but it is a verifiable statement, and that's dramatic if we should come to have empirical verification for something that has been predicted in Western monotheistic writings even before there was any scientific evidence on the scene. So um, I, I agree, it isn't, it isn't falsifiable, I think, but I do think it's verifiable, and, and therefore I think it's encouraging from a theistic standpoint, to see the support that modern science lends to a premise like number four, which I think does have theological significance. Well, I think that uh, our time is just about uh, gone. I don't want to, to, to presume on your time too much longer. So let me just say that I'll be happy to stick around here personally and just chat one-on-one -on -one with anybody who'd like to. But thank you very much for coming out. I've certainly enjoyed our dialogue this evening. <laughs>